Um, just a little, few housekeeping things first. Um, presentation slides are available for download on the um, Glipper website at www.glrppr.org on the meetings page. And as soon as we conclude the webinar and I get it archived, um, the, the webinar archive will be posted there also. Today I'm pleased to welcome Lynn Rubenstein from the State Electronics Challenge. She's going to talk to you about the environmental impact of office equipment and how the State Electronics Challenge can help you improve your environmental footprint. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them using the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel. There are several places where we'll pause to take questions and comments, and Lynn also said that it's okay if you put questions in, um, I can break in and ask on your behalf also. So with that, I will turn it over to Lynn. Great. Thank you, Laura. And I'm so pleased to have this opportunity. I, I actually love talking about the State Electronics Challenge and the opportunity to speak to the roundtable is particularly exciting for me. And um, I was serious about uh, what Laura just said. Please do interrupt. I have the ability to talk nonstop, and I'd much rather that this was actually reflected your interest. So, and I'm also capable of saying I'm getting there, so don't hesitate. So um, the State Electronics Challenge is a voluntary and free program that's open to all types of government entities, big and small, in the United States, other than federal, as well as any school, college, or university, and nonprofit organizations. Our focus is on life cycle stewardship of computers and imaging equipment in the office place. So we do that by looking at the three life cycle phases, purchasing, use, and of course, end of life management. So just a tiny bit of background. Um, the program was adopted from the Federal Electronics Challenge. You probably see where we got our name. A very successful program that was in place for many, many years that was recently retired, but we continue. Um, the State Electronics Challenge was initiated with funding from EPA headquarters, and then we've had regional EPA support over the years. Most recently, uh, we just completed a several-year Great Lakes um, initiative project through EPA Region 5. And we are currently funded, and will remain so, by private sector sponsorships, Samsung, Panasonic, the Consumer Electronics Association, and the ISRI R2 Rios programs all make this possible to be a national program and a program that will continue. And it is managed and staffed by the Northeast Recycling Council, so I am also the executive director of what we call NERC. So the term that we use about when you elect to participate, and so I have no secret agenda here. I want you all to sign up as partners. And that's what we call you. Um, anybody who signs up, uh, you are called a partner. And just to uh, give a little bit more detail, so we have state and tribal agencies. We have literally entire states, uh, cities where the governor has signed up the state, cities and towns, counties, K-12 schools, college and universities, public utilities, public libraries, municipal solid waste authorities and districts. This is sort of a sampling of the types of organizations that are participating. And most recently, we've expanded to include nonprofit organizations. We uh, just recently uh, had our 140th partner. And this is a, um, a simplified graphic of how our proportionally different entities are represented. Uh, we added this recently because people were curious about it. And we didn't know the answer. So there it is. So currently, as I said, there are 140 partners in 36 states. Uh, and so you'll see there's some big gaps out there, Nevada and Idaho, which I know are not Great Lakes states. I'm just commenting. Um, and the, um, they represent more than 173,000 end users. And why do I care about that number? I care because um, all these people have computers. And uh, many of them have access to imaging equipment, or perhaps their own imaging equipment. So the way we look at it is that while we have 140 partners, we're actually working with 173,000 people to impact the way that they buy, use, and manage at the end of life their electronic office equipment. And in the Great Lakes region, there are more than 50 partners. So why would you want to participate in the challenge, besides the fact that it's free and uh, you get points under the Illinois Green Government, Green Office Challenge? Um, so another good reason to sign up. So we give you free technical assistance and webinars. 
we have a lot of web-based resources on our website, and candidly, those are available to anybody, but um, we are prepared to develop new resources for partners if they uh, identify needs. We provide results based on best practices, so we give you recommendations about how to uh, behave, what to do within each of the life cycle phases, and I'll uh, go into a little bit of detail about those in a few moments. We give you tools to track your progress and measure results. And annually, we provide you with an individualized sustainability report. And then we also offer you awards. Now, I can't say cash prizes, but you do actually get a plaque and um, other forms of recognition for your activities, including what you were already doing. So we like to recognize the good works and good intentions of partners. Uh, just We're not just recognizing you for what you did from the moment you joined, but looking back over the year. And it's a calendar year perspective as well. So why focus on electronics? You probably already know much of this, which is why you're participating in this. But the, um, they have really, uh, frankly, disproportionate environmental impacts, mining through the end of life. The uh, harvesting of uh, materials include toxic constituents such as lead, mercury, and cadmium. Uh, ironically, once all of the noxious things have been harvested, including petroleum products for the plastic, all of a sudden you have these phenomenally valuable resources, both because of the um, embedded environmental impact of what it took to get them there and to process them, but because they have phenomenal uh, literal dollar value and resource value in the form of recycling. It's a rapidly growing waste stream in terms of the number of devices. In fact, the devices are getting lighter. So uh, there's a trend to look away from weight-based measurement. Um, but it's, in terms of objects, it's a very rapidly growing waste stream. And there really is this uh, disproportionate energy use. And it's in the creation of the devices. While their use phase is important, it is the creation of them where you get the really gigantic environmental impact. In fact, 80% of the life cycle energy of computers is due to its manufacturing. And that includes the harvesting and processing of the materials and then putting it in. So really, the best environmental thing you can do with electronic devices is to use them and not replace them. The longer that you keep them in use, but upgrading them, keeping them workable, doing software updates, not just letting them rot, um, the greatest environmental good is accomplished. Whoops. I guess I'm going to say that again since I hit the wrong button. So by greening the life cycle of these devices, you save energy and resources, and you do reduce the use of toxics. Uh, so as an example, and I'm going to pause after this slide and see if there's anybody that has any particular questions right now. Um, for every 1,000 green computer systems that you've purchased, and I'll describe what that is in a few moments, um, that you have power managed, which we'll talk about more also, and recycled after five years in use, you save enough power to, uh, to energy to power 100 homes. That uh, translates into avoided greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to about 177 cars per year. You avoid almost 50 tons of garbage um, and 15 tons of hazardous waste. And uh, the use ever of about, uh, well, I'm going to round up, almost 200 pounds of toxic materials. And that's because of the green qualification there. So we, we have calculators that we use, and we take your own information, and we develop um, sustainability reports. And I'll give you a little bit more detail about that in a few moments. But um, Laura, I wonder if there anybody has a question or comment at this moment, uh, and we can uh, go on if they don't. But I'll, I'll pause for just a second. Um, I don't see any, so I keep going. Okay. But that's right. And they can you know, always chime in. Yep. So why are we bothering you? Um, really, you know, we can be bug bugging other people, but why are we trying to challenge you? The truth is that institutional purchasers do, in fact, impact the marketplace. You uh, affect the way objects are designed, the uh, way that they are um, uh, opportunities for energy uh, avoidance, the Energy Star system and others uh, to save energy, the greater opportunities for avoiding costs. Um, now, very, very recently, the state of California 
I think like two weeks ago, released a study of office computers. And what they found was that they were on, literally on, 76% of the time. So we're not even talking in sleep mode. We're talking on, even when they were only used 16% of the day. Now that is horrible. And uh, one of the simpler things that you can change at home and in the office is to be sure that your power saving features are on. And that's really as simple as sleep mode. That's what we're talking about. Or in a um, copying uh, or, excuse me, an imaging device, it would be power down features. Now, one of the reasons besides the environmental good and, you know, Lynn's horror at waste is that you actually save money. Um, now, by activating power management features and keeping them activated, and keeping them activated actually can be a challenge because um, people turn them off. But let's pretend they are activated and in use. You can save between 10 and $100 per computer per year. And why the range is a combination of the cost of energy where you are, as well as uh, what type of power management features might you have already had in place. Plus $3 to $30 in cooling loads. Now you're not uh, in a hot climate, so you're probably closer to the $3 level. But um, you know, particularly if you've ever put a laptop in your lap, that gizmos get hot. And that means that in an office environment, they are adding heat to the room. And so in the summer, in places where there might be air conditioners, which there would be in, the, in your region, um, that means that you're paying more to cool. So avoided heat uh, uh, displacement is also a factor. And then for imaging equipment, um, similarly, when you use power down features when nobody's using the thing, um, you can save between $35 and $60 per year per device. So you not only are doing environmental good, you are literally saving money. Um, then you are also demonstrating leadership in sustainability and stewardship and showing it to your constituents. Um, and, that, and that honestly, uh, what we recommend that you do, how do you accomplish these things, is extremely simple. Uh, and you may find that you are doing some of them as, as organizations that are already interested in some of these things. So um, any uh, Laura, I see you put something, you put that up there, right? Yes, the I did. Yeah, I went out and okay. found a link okay, to so the I study. just suddenly saw something pop up. I thought, oh, that's oh. exciting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so anybody uh, who's wanting the studies that, um, that Lynn mentioned, I posted a link to the press release. Great. There are actually two studies. Yes. It is a fascinating report, I thought. It was really, well, depressing, but interesting. Um, so what are the state electronics challenges goals? We want to promote sustainability for office electronics within your organizations through best practices, focusing on purchasing, use, and end-of-life management. We want to help you when you want it. We don't force it on you. And we want to help document, recognize, and promote your success. That's important. Uh, people should realize what you're doing and the significant uh, contributions that you are making as a result. So. Um, I know you've already decided to join up as a partner, but what does it mean? It means that you join. Now, it, it is an online uh, registration form. It will literally take you less than two minutes. It is essentially your contact information. We ask uh, that you, for yourself, pick what you want to work on. So I want to work on purchasing, or I want to work on use, or end of life, or all three, or two. And this is your decision. Uh, you do what you want. You can start working on one and change your mind or move on to something else. It's just that uh, it helps to orient you by making uh, some choices about how you would like to begin. And we do find that many organizations choose to start with the ones where they've already made the greatest progress because that's the easiest uh, way to succeed. I mean, you, you get somewhere fast doing that. So then we ask you to complete what we call the benchmark survey of current practices. It is a simple form. It's a Word document. And basically, it's an opportunity for you to find out what you do or don't know. So we say things like, how many computers do you have? I don't know. <laughs> or we have 30. How many imaging devices do you have? We have 20. Well, what percentage of these things are power managed? I don't know. So it sort of gives you a sense of 
where the gaps are. It helps you figure out who you might want to be speaking with, who might want to help with these issues. Um, and it's also an opportunity to compare uh, your um, change over time. Then we ask you to implement best practices in the selected life cycle areas. We ask you to annually report on your progress and what you did. Now um, it's a little bit of a miracle. The benchmark survey of current practices and the annual report are the same document. It's just that we put a different title on it. So another advantage of actually looking at the benchmark is to know what sort of information we're going to ask you to report on a calendar basis. And so since you are probably all going to be running out and joining right now, we're pretty much at the end of the calendar year. So you could be reporting for all of calendar 2013, um, including uh, what you've already done. It doesn't, as I said earlier, it doesn't have to be just what you've changed since joining the program. And then uh, if you want, you can apply for an award, even if you've already earned the award uh, because of previous practices. So I'm now going to go through each of the life cycle phases and speak briefly about what we consider the best practices, what we ask you to do. Um, ask, that's in, uh, literal. We don't demand. We don't shame. This is what we suggest that you do. Um, so Laura, is there anything that I should be speaking to at this moment? No, there is not. So just keep right on going. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Um, so uh, purchasing, that's the first thing you do, of course. So that's the first one we're going to speak about. So we ask you to have an intentional practice of purchasing or leasing. I have the same, uh, when I say purchasing, I also mean leasing, for equipment that is green. And that is defined by the Electronic Products Environmental Assessment Tool, EP. And many of you may be familiar with that. But I, for those that aren't, I will, in the next slide, I believe, go into slightly more detail about it. So we want you to be doing this intentionally. So that can be done through a simple policy. It can be done through a procurement language. Um, it can be done uh, by law, you know, regulation. Um, there are a lot of ways to go about it, but we want it to be intentional. Uh, most people are accidentally buying EP, and while we're glad you are, we want that intentionality because that's what sends the marketplace signal to the manufacturers that we want this, we like this, and we're willing to support manufacturers who make these decisions. So then we say we want you to ensure that 95% of your desktops, laptops, monitors, printers, copiers, and multifunction devices are EPEAT registered. Now that 95% might sound like an alarming number. Uh, for um, all the computer-related devices, um, it would be extremely unusual if you were not already in that percentile. Um, this is where the intentionality comes in. The state of Illinois, for example, the state uh, procurement uh, standard and policies are already EPEAT. Um, other states in the region also have requirements of EPEAT procurement. So if you're in any way purchasing or leasing off a state contract, EPEAT is what you're buying. But again, if you didn't know that, um, we want you to know it on purpose. Um, hey, it can be a little bit more challenging with Imaging devices, because they were more recently added, um, and so there are a few fewer things. But we're also not telling you you have to go do anything. We're saying that prospectively, should you be, we would like you to. Hey, Lynn, so we've got we I've got a we've got a question. Okay, um, I've got actually two questions now. Oh my God! First, the first one is okay. <laughs> yeah, regarding purchasing, how would you compare the environmental impacts of one product versus another? Which I believe EP allows you to do, right? They do. They do. The EP, and I'm just going to um, uh, just, I mean, I'll go through this, but EP.net is the, is the URL for the official EP website. And um, on that website, there is the ability to, uh, the expression drill down very far to figure out, well, why is this gizmo gold? you know, the top of the line in terms of environmental accomplishments, why? What did it do to get those extra points? Uh, you can say, you know what, I only care about computers that have um, no mercury and recycled content. And so you can plug that in and sort accordingly. It's very, it has a lot of sort opportunities. Now, on the State Electronics Challenge website, uh, I commented earlier that we have a lot of resources on the website and that, you know, 
well, I'd like to trick you into becoming partners because of it, you can go there right now. So on, on the State Electronics Challenge website, under webinars, so there's a, you know, sort of the classic left-hand bar, scroll down, webinars, you will find, uh, and it's organized by the life cycle stages, you will find under purchasing a partner-only webinar that we did um, uh, this summer. It was put on by EP staff that does an amazing job, and there's a recording of it, of showing you how to use all the features of the EPEAT website. How do you do these searches? How do you identify the environmental impact of your decisions or of a particular one product over another? So it's a great uh, resource um, because while the site is fabulous, it's one of those things where it has so many things it can tell you that sometimes it can be a little hard to realize. It can tell you all those things. So I um, encourage you both to explore the EPEAT website, but also if you feel inclined to uh, take a look at the recording on the State Electronics Challenge website that I think has the title something like Navigating the EP website. Something okay, and yeah, and just like that. for the attendees, I'll, um, I'll go look that up and then put, put the link out okay. in chat, but I'll also Great. include it. All the links that, that Lynn mentions during the presentation today are also going on the Glipper website with the present link to the presentation slides and everything. So thank you. It'll all be in one place for you. Um, and then the next question somebody had was, how do EPEAT and Energy Star relate, or do they? They do. So um, the um, e this, so for a moment, I'm not answering your question, but well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to this slide, and then I'll I'll show you how it fits in here. So um, it is a, uh, EPEAT is a voluntary program. It's not a law or anything like that, unless. Uh, you happen to be in the state of Rhode Island where it actually is a law for public procurement to buy EP, which is the only state in the country that actually has it as a law. Um, but the uh, EP standards look at all kinds of environmental attributes. And there's a minimum thing you have to accomplish. There's a, um, I think it's 28 environmental attributes you have to meet um, under the current standard to be bronze certified, and then you get more points. There's optional points for silver, 50 optional points for 50% of the optional points for silver, and 75% of the optional points for gold. Bronze, to get bronze, you're not even, we're not even talking to you unless your device is compliant with the most current Energy Star um, standard for that type of device. So what has happened over the years is that every time the Energy Star has that upgrade, which is every few years, honestly, um, and they generally launch around the beginning of the year. We'll see. So, um, you know, right now there are more than 1,500 computer products listed on the EP registry with 26 manufacturers in the United States. It's an international standard, so you actually look by country, um, and more than a thousand, and about a thousand imaging. Uh, products. So if you, um, uh, if, and I'm just making this up because it's not about to happen, if um, Energy Star were in January going to be launching an entirely new requirement standard for computers or for imaging equipment, these numbers would plummet for a few months until the manufacturers were sure that all of the, all, that they had all of the new devices registered on the EP website that were meeting that criteria. And we've seen that cycle happen over time. So it's a it's a deal breaker. If you are not Energy Star compliant at the most current level for that type of device, you cannot be on the EP registry. Um, I'm very serious about that. <laughs> it's, it's really it's foundational to the whole thing. Um, and then uh, there is uh, EPEAT also has a verification process because this is voluntary and manufacturers are self-listing. You know, some of them are nicer and more noble than others. So there actually is a verification process to ensure that they were telling the truth. Um, trying to put that more gently, but that's what it is. Okay, there's a follow-up question. Okay. EPEAT is a great resource. Would you also consider other resources, for example, electronic products that are certified by UL Environment or other certification institutes? Yes and no. <laughs> it's actually a humongo question. Um, UL, not UL itself, but UL Environmental, which is, um, you know, sort of a, the UL specific environmental standard. Um, for a while there, it looked like they were going to have a competing computer standard. And that doesn't seem to have 
come to fruition. They were about to launch a cell phone one, which um, on a personal level I was looking forward to, and I just heard an announcement a week or two ago that they're not doing that. I don't know why. Um, I don't have the history behind it, but Lynn is disappointed. Um, there are um, uh, other environmental standards out there, um, green standards, and quite honestly, um, this is about to get extremely complicated. So let me just say that uh, in terms of the state electronics challenge, as new um, uh, procurement standards that are as rigorous and as all-encompassing as EP were to become available, we would definitely be looking at it. So, for example, the imaging equipment thing, that's new. I mean, that just happened a couple of years ago. Now, it happened to have been EP, um, the Green Electronics Council. Uh, so we changed the entire uh, Steel Electronics Challenge program to incorporate that. So certainly as things modify. So um, if, if any of you folks are seriously IT people, you may have noticed that I have said nothing about servers. EP does not currently have a server standard. There is one in development. And there is a competing one in development. There are two uh, certification uh, standard development organizations that are at this very moment writing green procurement standards for servers. What are we going to do? <laughs> Both of those are out there. What are we going to do? The the um, EP one is going to happen faster. It's going to be it's, it's scheduled to be completed and, and public um, by the middle of next year. The other one is about um, two years off. But when it's done, uh, will we probably um, say either one of them? Yes. Now, the other thing that's going on is that this particular, uh, the EP computer standard is old at this point. This is the original one. I participated in the development of it. Um, it's, um, it's old. And we always intended for it to be updated. And that update, that refresh, is in progress right now. And so we're anticipating that um, when that is finished, which hopefully will be next year, that that will be much more rigorous. And um, that may, uh, depending on who ends up owning it, it might not be EP. It might be a different standard. So then we'll just have to change all these slides. And that was an oversimplification. So if you wanted to follow up with me on that, I'd be happy to have a much more in-depth conversation about it. Great, thanks. Sure, but that that person, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So that was purchasing. To, to simplify, do it on purpose. Go eat. eat. So then use is. I bought it. I bought my EP gizmo. Or even if you didn't have EP, you're just in your office and nobody's bought a new thing in a decade, um, still there are things that you can do. So um, in each of these life cycle phases, there's something intentional. We want you to knowingly be doing something. And so under use, it's having a policy that promotes power management and paper use reduction. Um, we want to, you to be sure that all the energy star sleep functions are enabled. And this goes back to people are tricky. Um, uh, if your device is an EP device, it actually comes with the sleep function turned on. And then your average citizen turns it off because they go to the bathroom and it takes 10 seconds for the thing to come back, and they can't live with it. So they do it. Or they've got to be in their bonnet that you really can't safely put things in sleep overnight because all sorts of horrible things happen. Not true. Um, and particularly if you're on a network system and you're an IT person, you know how to make this all happen. There's, there's software packages and all kinds of things that make this totally workable. And we have a lot of information about that on the State Electronics Challenge website, including a great really simple um, guidance document for a moron like me, because when I first started working on this stuff, I didn't understand what any of this meant. Um, what does this mean, and how do I turn on my sleep functions? You know, where are they? Um, how do I find power management software if I'm a, if I'm a server person, or you know, a networked person? Um, lots of great resources out there. Um, and so the equivalent in a imaging equipment is called power down. But it's the same idea. When you're not using it, it should not be in a full power state. Uh, this goes back to that California study that Laura has now put um, uh, a link, link to the two companion 
studies. And we want you to save paper. Um, why not? I'll talk about that in a moment. Extend the life of equipment. I spoke about that earlier. Really, really, the most important thing you can do is to extend the life of equipment, even by a couple of months. It makes a very dramatic environmental difference. And, and, and I'm going to uh, get even more on my soapbox here and say it's not just environmental. It's human health and safety. Um, uh, most of us can be grateful that we live in a country where the raw materials being harvested to make these gizmos are not being harvested. It's happening in third world nations where there's tremendous geopolitical conflict and death and god awful things happening to people just to get the supplies for these devices. And anything you can do to not buy or lease a new gizmo is saving lives and the environment. And so gigantic soapbox there. Um, but you can't, you know that you can't just ignore them. You have to do software updates. You have to, you know, if they're not working, you get somebody to fix it. Um, in terms of paper consumption, we want you to ensure that when you have a device that can print double-sided, not everybody does, but that you um, have it defaulted on at least 75% of the time to double-sided printing. This is, ironically, about the most controversial thing in this entire program. I find it really interesting how upset people get about when we start speaking about double-sided printing. And that's not even taking it the next step where I start lecturing you about why are you printing at all. But that's not in here. Um, uh, any questions at this point, or should I go to the end of life? Um, I think you can move on to end of life. It looks like we have nothing right now. So. OK, people are so stuck on the fact that I want them to print double-sided that they don't know what to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, end of life management. Again, the policy. Um, if possible, have a policy that promotes reuse and donation. We are aware that there are circumstances, whether it be by law or for other reasons, why reuse is literally not available to you. So we accommodate that. Um, it's just a reality check. Um, but we want you to require environmentally sound management to, to know what is happening with your devices. You don't just say, oh, good, somebody's taking them away. That's not enough. We want you to track what you're doing. Um, am I just having it redeployed internally? That's a way to extend life. Uh, that you have, um, if you've donated it for reuse, that you um, send along information about responsible recycling, and um, or that you recycle. But you keep track of these things. This is important to know what's happening. And then, really important, that you use a recycler that has earned third-party certification to um, either the R2 standard, the R2 Rios standard, or East Stewards. We are um, uh, ambivalent about which one this is. I don't care. Just that you have to use a recycler that has earned one of these and currently has one of these certifications. So for some, the concept of third-party certification may not be entirely familiar. So it is um, when you have an independently developed standard that I identifies the essential criteria for a uh, recycling company, electronics recycling company, in terms of worker health and safety, and environmental health and safety, and data destruction, um, and that you are looking at this all the way down through its life cycle, all the way, you know, Lynn takes it apart, she sends it to somebody else, that person to something else, they send it to somebody else. You're following it all the way down. And so the standards I define very specifically about what is expected of a, a recycler to have achieved these responsible um, requirements. That was a redundant sentence. Um, and how does this happen? There are independent auditors outside companies that are hired by the recyclers to look at them. And they do audits, paper, and on-site. Um, to determine if the recycler has met these qualifications and if they should be accredited to the specific standard. And, and you know, you would apply for uh, one, one or two of the standards. I mean, it's up to the recycler which one they would go for. So it saves purchasers from having to define what a responsible recycler is. They can say, um, we are requiring that they have one of these certifications and then feel confident that people who are expert in the industry and in the sorts of uh, worker health and safety and environmental risks that the equipment can present um, 
that they have uh, articulated it and that somebody independent from the recycler has checked. A recycler saying to you, I meet the requirements of, is not believable. If they met the requirements, they would be certified. Short of an independent third-party certification, I don't believe what anybody says. That didn't get people mad enough? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Firing that. So those are um, the best managed practices that we recommend that you do. So what do we do to try to help you make those changes or to achieve that good? As I indicated, there are a lot of online resources for each life cycle phase on the State Electronics Challenge website. Once you're a partner, if you identify resources that you need that aren't there, we will get them for you. Um, we offer free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance uh, upon request. As I said earlier, we don't force it upon you. We have partner-only webinars several times a year on specific topics of interest. And you'll see when you go to the website, um, uh, either the PowerPoints or more recently recordings, you know, technology changed. And we also have a partner-only listserv. So we ask you to annually, uh, well, start with your benchmark survey of current practices and then miraculously uh, at the end of the calendar year, uh, the exact same form, you fill it out again and it's called the annual reporting form. And then we take that information and we calculate the environmental impacts of your activities. And we provide you with a customized sustainability report and people love these things. So here is an example of what it looks like from one of your uh, Great Lakes um, partners from DuPage County, Illinois, who has done outstanding work. Um, and so we talk about the individual environmental benefits on the purchasing, use, and reuse and recycling. And then we uh, total those benefits, um, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. And then we talk about the total impact. So they saved 394 metric tons of um, greenhouse gas emissions in uh, calendar 2012. So if you submit your annual report, then you may apply for recognition. And bronze, silver, gold, depending on if you have completed all of the uh, best management practices for one, two, or three of the life cycle phases. So that's, uh, that's the next level. You have to have done everything we've suggested. And you can de you demonstrate that um, through an application and a paper trail. Um, and as I said, even this includes things that you've already done, particularly if you came in right now and we were looking at calendar 2014. Well, obviously, it's late in the year. You'd only been a partner for a couple of weeks. It's not like we think you're, we're going to change the world in two weeks. Um, but we would still look back at all of 2014 to recognize you for that. And you do get a physical award. We offer you press releases. We do um, a lot of publicity on the State Electronics Challenge website as well as on the NERC website. And um, it really helps people build internal support for your own activities. And as I commented on earlier, to be recognized for what you have achieved and what you've contributed to your organization. Lynn, we do have a question. Um, okay. She's, and I'm actually, I think it's more of a, of a I need a website question. But uh, okay. uh, so, what resource can we use to verify certification, state or federal? And I, and I was actually, as the question came in, was um, looking at the e stewards website, and there is a directory there. I'll post the link momentarily. Yeah. Um. Here's here's what I would recommend. Um. On the State Electronics Challenge website, we have one document that gives you the links to the oh. various. Uh, Great. Sites okay. that you can go to the East. Quite candidly, unless the East Steward site, um, unless you happen to go to exactly the right page, is a little bit confusing. Okay. Because they list companies that are applying as oh, well as okay. received. So okay. you have to go to, to the exact to the right page where it's just the received. Um, but there are three websites. There's the R2 website, mm -hmm. uh, the East Steward's website, as Laura was referencing, and the R2 Rios website. And okay. uh, they all make an earnest attempt to keep them as up to date as possible. Um, there are a number of certified recyclers who have um, uh, a physical footprint, <coughs> excuse me, in the Great Lakes region. Um, but I will also comment that um, recyclers move all over the United States. So you know, if you're in um, you know Indiana and you decide that. Um, well, I don't see any recyclers that I like, or frankly, I don't know if there are any in Indiana. There probably are. Um, it doesn't really matter all that much. Trucks 
people use trucks. And um, stuff moves around all over the place. So while it's really nice to be able to support a local recycler, um, I wouldn't limit yourself to that expectation or that need. They, okay, they, so they, they're all over the place. Okay, and the state or the on this on the SEC website is that under resources and then recycling? Is that where those yeah. those links are? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep. Now, I also say that I, if I heard um, your summary of the question correctly, you said state and federal. And um, there are no federal requirements that relate to, they don't, to recycling facilities. They don't issue permits. They're not licensing them. There is no federal anything. So sometimes you'll hear recyclers say, oh, I, you know, I have a federal permit. Well, they're lying to you because there's no such thing as it relates to electronics recycling. Most states have no requirements that relate to electronics recyclers. To you know, point my finger at Illinois again, you don't even have to um, have told. You just have to tell the state that you exist. There's nothing else required of you. Um, and many states don't even require that. So uh, depending on what state you're in, there may be no state requirements either. And so in particularly in those sorts of contexts, having a certification becomes even more important because you've got somebody who's actually looking at these things. There is a little bit of a difference, and sometimes people um, uh, assume that the same thing, but they're not. Um, most of the Great Lakes states have laws about manufacturers being responsible for taking back electronics for recycling. And in many of those laws, not all, but in many of those laws, there are requirements about the recyclers in order to get money paid to them by the state as part of this program. But that varies by state, and that is referencing a particular program. It's not an overall comment about um, the qualification of a recycler independent of participating in those laws. Okay. Did that? I hope that confused people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Joy also posted a link to um, uh, EP, US EPA does maintain a list of certified recyclers. Yes, they do. They do try to. They're not always, um, nobody's a million percent up to date. So yes, they do try to do that as well. That is true. So Thank I will you, also Joy. make that link available to Great. everybody. Thank you. Um, should I go on? Yes, please do. Okay. So, you know, how much will it cost? So first I told you that you're going to save money, and, and on top of that, this is free. So there is no cost to join. There's no cost for technical assistance. There is no obligation on your part. I mean, we, as I said, we don't come after you. You, you do the best that you can. Um, what we cannot pay for are things like recycling. You know, they serve sort of the more out-of-pocket costs. And then very importantly, well, just how much work is this? I mean, you said it would take me two minutes to sign up, but that's not all we're talking about. So um, first of all, it depends on what goals you have. If, for example, you pick to you pick a life cycle stage or you've done all of it already, well, all you have to do is submit your annual report and ask for an award, and you got it. So that's pretty simple. Um, if you uh, want to work on something that you've never put any effort into, um, that can make, um, of course, will make it harder and more time consuming. And then that's when it becomes incredibly important about who is on your team, or is there a team? Are you the only person? who's interested in this? Uh, can you get other people in the organization or perhaps from other departments that you may not have had a historical relationship with? So sometimes we find that there's people who are very involved in recycling, um, and uh, but they also want to see the power management stuff happening. And it turns out they have to develop relationships with the IT department. So um, sometimes it's really a matter of identifying who in, the, in your organization would need to be involved and, and would they like to be involved? That's uh, always a question. Um, 